When most people think about business and employment, they usually consider it from an economic perspective. They think about their jobs, their wages, their income, and whether or not they have enough cash to meet life's basic needs like food, clothing, and shelter, and transportation. That's certainly an important perspective, but most people don't realize that employment and income are also about health, the health of individuals, families, and communities. Income is the greatest predictor of health of individuals and the health of a community, and income is related to having a job and what that job pays. States that have a strong economy, low levels of unemployment, and good wages are also the healthiest. Minnesota is a great example of this, a healthy state with a healthy economy. But that didn't happen by accident. It got that way through some forward-thinking public policies and a variety of strategic public and private investments. But with the world's economy and Minnesota's population changing rapidly, Minnesota's status is not guaranteed. To retain its position, Minnesota will need to be creative and innovative in its policies and investments in employment and economic opportunities. We'll talk about Minnesota's economic risks and opportunities on today's episode of A Public Health Journal. Please stay tuned. Welcome to A Public Health Journal, a program that explores public health issues facing our society today and tomorrow. The host of the show is Dr. Ed Ellinger, Commissioner of Health for the State of Minnesota. A Public Health Journal is sponsored by the Minnesota Department of Health and the Hennepin County Human Services and Public Health Department, all working together towards the goal of healthy people living in healthy communities. Income is the greatest predictor of health. As one's income increases, the chances of being healthy also increase. Because our economy is such a major determinant of our state's overall health, I thought it important to talk about what's being done to create a robust and healthy economy in Minnesota. And besides talking about what's being done today, we'll be looking at the risks and opportunities that lie ahead for our state's economy. Joining me in that discussion is Sean Tara Hardy, Commissioner of the Department of Employment and Economic Development, or DEED. DEED is the state agency dedicated to growing Minnesota's economy and building and strengthening a world-class workforce. Under Commissioner Hardy's leadership, DEED has partnered with communities and businesses to support business growth and greater opportunities for workers across the state. Shantara, welcome to the program. Thank you, Commissioner. And it's nice, uh, you've been Commissioner of DEED now for about five or six months. And, and Around that time. Yeah, so you've come in at a really good time because we've just heard that the economy is, is booming. The economy or it's is, growing. It's growing, yeah. it's growing. So we wanna talk about that because as I said, it really is linked to health. But first, tell us a little bit about DEED. You know, what is its purpose and why did it get started and sort of what do you do? Um, DEED is the state's um, premier economic development agency. We're focused on um, how to make sure that we have uh, an economy that's working for our business, that we are providing our businesses with the talent that they need to function. Um, we're, we are really focused on what I like to um, put in the bucket of capital. We're focused on investing in human capital, we're focused on investing in capital from an economic standpoint, and we're also focused on investing in capital from an infrastructure standpoint. That built environment is very important to making sure that um, businesses and communities are able to thrive. And so our focus is um, really making sure Minnesota is healthy economic-wise from a state perspective, but also that we have a global um, perspective on being able to be competitive. And so that is the focus of the Department of Employment and Economic Development. Right. And how is Minnesota doing in the economic realm? Overall, Minnesota is doing well. Um, we have very low unemployment. Um, we are very fortunate to have 17 Fortune 500 companies, um, continuous investment from small business. Overall, we're doing well. Um, but the numbers also tell us a story about um, some parts of our state that are not doing so well. Right. So why generally is Minnesota doing well compared to many other states in, a, in our region? I think when you think about the um, investments that we've made, um, the policy decisions that we've made um, in the past, we're actually seeing those play out. Um, really being focused on making sure that um, we're investing in our communities um, from a standpoint of you know housing infrastructure that we're investing in our schools that we have policies that um, really lead to making sure that we have the workforce that's going to be the talented um, workforce that our businesses need we've really invested in a number of policies that have positioned us mm -hmm. for this and businesses want to come here mm -hmm. businesses want to invest and that's really been um, a success um, from the public sector the private sector, the nonprofit sector. And so we really have a, um, 
a very robust partnership in all of those um, parts of um, our economy. All right, and I want to talk about specifically about some of those, because I said we were talking about how it's, uh, economic development is actually linked to health. And we have a slide here that we did with an income and health report that mm -hmm. shows that in Minnesota, as your income rises, your life expectancy increases. There's eight and a half year difference between mm -hmm. people at the lowest end and people at the highest end. And actually there's a three and a half year difference just from that lowest quintile of income, mm -hmm. you know, the lowest 20% to the next lowest. So that really there's some really big changes that can make. But all of this life expectancy gain really determines one thing, whether or not you have a job and Absolutely. what that pays. So how, do you, how are you working with the community to say, all right, how do we lower unemployment rate and how do we actually build higher paying jobs? We are, we are really focused on how do we position Minnesotans to have access to family sustaining wages. And that is um, very important when we think about the role of the department really investing in training. Um, a lot of the jobs that are in Minnesota are looking for you know, high skilled employees and so our department, through a number of our programs, our Job Skills Partnership Program, our Career Pathways programs, that really connect to education institu institutions, the, the um, uh, private sector, and the nonprofit sector. And so we're investing in um, those types of programs to be able to provide that access. And when you think about that life expectancy, when you have a job, you're not stressed about where I'm going to eat, where I'm going to live. You have the opportunity possibly to have access to transportation to get to the job. And so it's, you know, bundled in, um, as you know, kind of those social determinants of health that really drive, you know, how your quality of life will turn out. Right. And I know that we have some real disparities in, in income, unemployment rates mm -hmm. among people of color in American mm -hmm. Indian desire. And I want to mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that, but first we need to take a little break. All right. We'll be back right after this message. How can I help my daughter with her reading? Searching for help with Dachshund Reading. Why do you not get me? I do. This is what it feels like for kids with learning and attention issues. Redirecting to understood.org. Join parents and experts at understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues to help your child thrive. Welcome back. We're talking about DEED, the Department of Employment and Economic Development in Minnesota, and the link between economic development and health with Shantara Hardy, who is the commissioner of DEED. Shantara, when I moved to the state in 1980, we had 2% people of color and American Indians. We're now up to close to 20%. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we've seen with that changing demography, we've actually identified that we have some huge disparities. And we have a slide here that, that shows sort of the unemployment rate disparities uh, between African Americans, Hispanics, and whites. And you can mm -hmm. see that you know, generally it's, we're making progress towards the end of reducing those disparities, but they're still really uh, quite dramatic. So how does that focus your work? How do you, you know, and I know the Dayton administration has really talked yes. about equity and this is a big issue, particularly in employment. What kind of activities have you done to address this? This, um, as you um, have shown in the slide, is a really huge um, issue that we need <laughs> to make sure that we're focusing on. Um, as you think about that change in demographics, we are needing to make structural changes, structural changes from a policy standpoint, and really change the way we do business because the people that are going to be our workforce um, tomorrow, literally, um, is not the workforce we had yesterday. And so the governor and lieutenant governor um, really focusing on how do we invest in um, training. And so our department is really focusing on how do we partner with community organizations that are on the ground that have the relationships to really invest in training. One of the other things when you think about um, this work truly through the lens of moving people up the ladder, it's about wealth creation. And so our department is looking at how do we make sure we're investing in that innovation and entrepreneurship. Because when you look at the data of who is really employing members that are in our community, it's small businesses. And so a lot of those businesses are employing people that look like them. And so when we really make the investment in small business and entrepreneurship, we are able to really move people up that ladder. And we're also able to, when it comes to the different type of businesses that are being invested in, 
help us with some of the issues that are impacting because usually that's when most people start a business mm -hmm. is they're trying to solve some type of issue mm -hmm. that is happening around them and right. so and I know that we, do, we don't like to admit it, but we're a very segregated state. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and, and so some of the communities where people of color live are low-income communities. Mm -hmm. We've not done a lot of investment. Are you doing some targeted investments in certain areas to try to, to improve the, the whole stature of that community? Yes. I mean, one of mm -hmm. the things we have to be um, very honest about is that what is going to work in um, the, on the east side of St. Paul is not going to work. In Bemidji, is not going to work. Um, in Red Lake. And so being number one, um, honest and um, intentional about the investments we make. And that comes with building relationships. And so targeting um, the type of programs that we have, um, our career pathways programs, really looking at some of the people that are facing barriers, individuals that have a criminal record, individuals that may have transportation issues or child care issues, that plays into employment opportunities. And so our programs are taking that into consideration. And how do we think about the whole person mm -hmm. if we really want to make sure that we want to move people into sustaining jobs that actually turn into careers? And that's some of the um, things that we're really looking at in the department. And that's going to take time. We don't have time, but it's going to take time to really um, get on a course that we're actually seeing people um, move um, up the ladder. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned, you know, certainly education is a huge mm -hmm. part of this. And I've got a couple of slides here that really show that link between education mm -hmm. and health, and that actually then that link between education right. and income. You know, this slide just basically shows that uh, as we move along in this century, if you're well educated, your life expectancy is going up. Mm -hmm. If you're not, if you have less than a high school diploma, education, you're actually, your life expectancy is going down. So there's a huge link. Uh, and then the next slide sort of shows why that is. It shows that as you have more education, you make more money. Absolutely. <laughs> and as I showed earlier, the more money you make, the healthier you are. Absolutely. So how does this play in the fact that, you know, education is really important for health and it's really important for, for making more money, which linked to health. And then that's sort of back to my first question. How are you targeting the saying, kids, stay in school, get an education, and how are you supporting that? How are you working with K-12 education and higher ed to do that kind of work? This, this is so important. Um, to, as you pointed out, the um, higher education, um, the better your earnings will be, and that's important, and also your opportunities. And so when you, when you think about, um, I think one of the um, things that we're investing in is a high school diploma or a GED. Um, I learned quickly that you have to think about that not solely from the lens of education, that a GED and a high school diploma is actually a workforce credential. If you don't have it, you're not going to get in on the job. And so for us, it is so important for us to be partnering with um, K-12 and partnering with um, higher education because that is a ticket. Getting that GED or high school diploma is the ticket for you to get access to other opportunities. And so we're investing in that through some of our programs, um, our youth um, at work programs, our um, different type of apprenticeship programs. We are investing in that credential because mm -hmm. that is your ticket into getting into those higher paying jobs. And so we absolutely see that link between education and your wages. And if we don't make those investments and if we don't, um, you know, do our job and um, really um, provide opportunity um, as people go through the K-12 system. On the other end, when it comes into workforce and it comes into looking at our numbers on unemployment, um, we'll see it. Yeah. We'll see it. When, in preparing for this program, I came across one slide, which is the next one, which is the one thing that really shocked me. <clears throat> that. It says that you know the share of all jobs that will require post-secondary education in Minnesota, it's the highest in the country. Uh, I mean, so that we are a state that needs really, really highly educated people for the jobs that are here. That puts us at a disadvantage in some respects, but it's mm -hmm. an ad advantage. How do, how do you use this slide in your work to say, we really, if we're going to be a good state, we're a, we're a high information state, we're mm -hmm. a highly educated state, and we really need to push those graduation levels and, and post-secondary education activities? It's, it's what we were talking about before. It's that partnership between um, um, K-12 and higher education. Um, when we, we are, we are um, very blessed to have 
um, the type of companies that we have that are looking for high skilled workers. Um, when we think about our jobs, I'll use for example healthcare. One in six jobs in Minnesota are healthcare related. And a lot of that comes with wanting a high skilled or um, you know, highly educated people. And to your point, that's kind of a gift and a curse um, when it comes to really getting people off of uh, the sidelines. Where do you start? How do you make sure they get that credential? And how do you keep encouraging to go to the next level of education? And so that's something that is, is so important, as I said, is that partnership between education um, and the work that we do at DEED um, because our, our businesses are telling us mm -hmm. we need the workers. We need we need those workers that are, you know, really looking at STEM, that are thinking about science and technology, um, that are the engineers. Um, but I will say, you know, even with this slide, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we need the continuum of workers. We need those workers um, that are really going to be able to help us in the technical space. We need the welders. We need, we need all those other types of um, careers to be able to truly have a comprehensive economy. And so we can't lose sight, even though we're you know, number three on that slide, of you know, wanting those types of skills. It is a continuum that we have to invest in because some of you know, our, our companies are doing awesome work um, in the technical fields too, so. Yeah, well, I mean, this slide shows that, and, and I know from my experience that people move to states where there are opportunities, but mm -hmm. the opportunities here are really for highly skilled workers, and that put, that's a, as you say, it's a blessing and a curse. And we do, I do want to talk about what you just mentioned, that we need a whole range of, mm -hmm. of, of workers, and I'll get into that, but first we need to take another break. All right. We'll be back right after this message. I already knew that I was going to go to college, you know, from a young age. I definitely want to major in political science. After that, I'm going to get my law degree. Then I'm going to come back to Detroit, boost the economy, become the mayor or something, try to make the situation better for other people. I feel like I owe it to the city. I'm determined. It's, it, it's going to happen. My name is Justin, and I am your dividend. Welcome back. Your dividend to staying with us is the fact that you get to listen to the deed commissioner, Shantara Hardy, talking about economic development in, in Minnesota. Uh, Shantara, I mean, that was just a perfect example of you invest in kids mm -hmm. and, and they, that's what we do it. You mm -hmm. know, we, we, that is. We it's investing that, not just for now, but down the road. For tomorrow. It's that return on investment. And to be able to have a successful child, you know, really take our you know, community to the next level, to me, that's a high investment. Yeah. So yeah, well, let's let's so let's talk sort of granular, you okay. know, about things that are going on. And um, I know you had mentioned that h healthcare mm -hmm. workers are one of the growing fields. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one link to health. You know, Absolutely. Have, but I have a slide here that shows where the job growths are mm -hmm. in in uh, in Minnesota over the last year or so, and it shows that you know the ones below the line are uh, you know decreasing number, mm -hmm. and the ones above the line, and, and so construction and education and health services. What are the the fields that are growing in Minnesota? where we need workers? Um, when we think about uh, the changing of demographics, specifically starting with healthcare, um, you know, I like to say we're getting grayer and browner. And on that grayer, needing to have um, professionals um, in the healthcare sector, your RNs, um, your physician assistants, because a lot of the investment, as you know, in healthcare, um, really giving the opportunity to those mid-level, so really investing in kind of those middle skills types of positions. Um, we're going to need those, especially um, in our cities that may not be able to attract um, doctors, you know, the physician assistants in the greater Minnesota and, and those, um, those types of positions. Um, you know, in the, in the construction space, we're really seeing a lot of um, investment um, in a number of large projects where as we think about a city most of our cities are built you know but where is that opportunity for density and things like that and so um, you're seeing a lot of um, you know investment in um, you know your your uh, electricians um, 
you're seeing a movement toward um, sustainability, you know, and so where are those opportunities in those spaces to be able to retrofit our buildings and things like that. And so it's a, it's a number of different areas that you're, you're seeing. The other area that, as you all know, everything is connected. And so a lot of investment in um, technology, you know, jobs, when I talked about earlier from a technical space, we're seeing a lot of investment in coders and, you know, the internet of things that is connecting people every day. And so you're seeing a lot of that type of growth and in Minnesota being a very innovative state where we're really jumping right in to make sure that we are be able to stay ahead of um, those professions to make sure we have the people available. I, I noticed certainly in, in the healthcare field, a lot of the workers, particularly for nursing assistants and, mm -hmm. and community health workers, are actually immigrants. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and people come to this state, you know, we're a very welcoming state for mm -hmm. immigrants. We have a large number of, of immigrants. How do you work with, with keeping people, for people coming from other cultures? How do you get them licensed and mm -hmm. approved and, and working? Because that's a huge part of the workforce, sort of the entry level, particularly mm -hmm. in the healthcare field, but I'm sure in many of the other areas, education, the same thing. Absolutely. A lot of how we are, are touching community to go through that process of licensure is through our workforce centers. And so we have over 48 workforce centers um, and they all come in a variety of different flavors. You know, we are building um, a new prominent one in North Minneapolis on Broadway. We have a number of them on Minsky campuses, a number of them in partnerships with um, different counties or whatever. And so that's how people are accessing. Through there, we are working with nonprofit organizations to take people through to get those credentials. And so um, partnering with organizations, um, you know, that are really allowing for people to go through um, getting their GED and then going off to get those skills. And so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a huge partnership um, when you think about those communities um, in particular, that's access into the economy and that's work that um, actually some of them in their own country may have done. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's very refreshing to be able to see um, um, someone who come to this country that um, was a nurse and were able to transfer those skills. Um, you know, for us, when I talk to um, members in, in the um, immigrant community, what I don't want to see is we have cab drivers that are physicians that were physicians mm -hmm. in the countries for 30 years. And so how do we make sure that we are partnering with the education institution to have a real conversation about changing demographics, about the importance of the workforce to reflect the community that you're serving? Where is the opportunity to get those people off mm -hmm. the sideline to use those skills that they've been using for over 30 years mm -hmm. or so? In the last minute that we have, I do want to talk about one other, because my next show is going to be talking about Olmstead and okay. disabilities. And mm -hmm. you do a lot of work with Absolutely. people with disabilities. So just briefly, what is, I don't want to forget that okay. group. Okay, so very um, important. Um, at DEED, we actually do a lot of work with individuals with physical disabilities. And so we have an amazing team for state services for the blind that are providing access to that community and amazing work in our bulk rehab um, department that really is helping people be able to be in the workforce. Um, your uh, physical ability is, 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 should not determine how you live your life. And so if we are partnering and having relationships with that community to be able to provide access to opportunity, that's what those departments do, mm -hmm. and they do a tremendous job of doing that. Right. So, Well, Shantara, this has been great. We have a Thank lot you. more to talk about. I know. We don't have enough <laughs> time, so uh, we'll have to have you back talking about Thank additional you. things. But, but great, good working with you, because we're all in this together we're to all create in this a together. healthier Minnesota in economy and in health and physical and mental. So, Absolutely. Great. Thank you. And I'll be back with a closing comment right after this message. Why is my son having trouble in school? Finding lowest airfare to Istanbul. No, I'm tired of fighting with my son over his homework. Home, walk, restaurant, need a review? No, he's smart, but his mind wanders. Seven wonders of the world. Why don't you understand me? I do. I was trying to show how Connor feels every day. Redirecting to understood.org. Join parents and experts at understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues to help your child thrive.
When 19th century industrialization drove workers from the farms and home workshops into urban areas and factory work, our economic system changed dramatically. This change was particularly devastating for poor families and children. Working conditions were unregulated and often unsafe, leading to tens of thousands of work-related deaths. Millions of children were forced to work long hours in hazardous conditions at low wages because their poor families desperately needed the income to supplement the parents' low wages. While factory owners thrived, the reality for children was poor health and loss of educational opportunities. Today, our economic system is again changing rapidly and dramatically. We are moving from an industrial to an informational economy where education and training are essential for economic success. And like a century ago, low-income families, populations of color, and children are at greatest risk of not benefiting from these changes. That's why, to be successful, the state's economic development activities need to be built on a strong educational system that meets the needs of all children. If low-income groups don't get educational opportunities available to the more well-to-do, they'll be hard-pressed to escape from the poverty that is so devastating to the health of their body, mind, and spirit. High-quality education for all is the best economic development tool we have. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. I hope you can join us again next time on A Public Health Journal.